Welcome to the Book Talk. My name is Patrick, Patrick Karekezi, and today we bring to you a great book. She's an author of three books. She was born in New York City, but she's African, from Ghana. She's a patron and co-chair of Institute of Africology based in South Africa. A mother of six children with 25 grandchildren and 50 great-grandchildren. She has a passion for Africa and helping so many other Africans that are in the diaspora repatriate. I bring her to She is Imams. You're most welcome to the show. Thank you very much. You have a passion for helping Africans return to Africa. True, I do. Yeah, that's really I surprising do. that we already said that uh, from our childhood we were told that America is a land of great opportunities. And you were in America for 50 years. You had a great job. I could say you had literally everything you, want, you wanted within that specific space. But later on, about 32 years ago, you escaped from America. You said you escaped from America. True. Why did you escape from America? Uh, because one, <coughs> America is not everything that most people, especially in foreign countries, think that America is. Um, it is the land of golden opportunity, uh, but it depends on who you are. And everything that we as African people have acquired in America, we have fought for. We have fought for um, better education, better housing, better jobs, um, living in areas that would accept us, um, everything, everything we've had to fight for in America. So, you know, for, for us, um, as Africans born in America, we've had to fight for everything that we've gotten mm -hmm. from fighting to be freed as enslaved Africans, fighting for a better job, fighting for the uh, opportunity to be able to vote, which is, is really a joke because every 25 years in America, the voters' rights bill is reviewed to determine whether or not I and people that look like me will have the opportunity to continue voting. We're the only ethnic group in America that that applies to. So, you know, uh, when people go to America, one thing about my brothers and sisters when they go to America, they will never come back and tell you what a struggle they had to live in America. Because, you know, part of our culture in Africa is that um, you've gone to America or you've gone foreign. Um, you're a been to, been to America, been to Europe. That's what they call them in Ghana. Right. And they call us Obruni, Obruni. foreigners. Uh -huh. right. And um, with that, because of our culture in Africa and in Ghana, right. if you've gone foreign and you've worked and you can't come back and bring gifts and everything for your family, your mother, father, sister, brother, your community, you know, they don't want to see you. Don't, no, 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 daddy, don't come right. because you will consider a failure. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, if I decide that I want to go back to America, mm -hmm. to that place that I escaped from, I can go back with my empty hands, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Then they would be happy just to see me. Mm -hmm. I would not be considered a failure. Okay. And you authored a book? I have authored three books. Three books. My first book was um, a book called Points to Ponder. How do you get ready? to leave America, escape America. What are the preparations that are necessary in order to make that move? And I wrote it based on experiences that I had from people who were visiting Africa. And they came with toilet paper, um, tuna fish, beans, frankfurters in a can, all kinds of medicine and stuff, because they had been told that we didn't have any of that stuff in Africa. Mm -hmm. um, we come with our own preconceived notions of what Africa is, 
We come with slangs. For example, in Africa, I, I could never ask you, are you crazy? If I ask somebody that in America, they would not get mad. They don't get pissed off. But in Ghana, if I ask you, are you crazy? They go, what? You call me crazy? What? Then they want to beat me. Different, different things that, um, what I call cultural norms, we put those things in the book. Mm. Who do you contact in an emergency? And words that are acceptable, you know, things you want to learn the, the language. What, you want to be able to say thank you. You want to be able to say where's the market? How much is the money? Things like that. That's what that book consisted of. Okay. And it grew from 15 pages to what it is now, about 80 pages on how do you get ready to escape. <laughs> how do you get ready to escape from America? Right. And that was your second book? <laughs> that was my first book. Your first book. My second book mm -hmm. I wrote is entitled Returning Home Ain't Easy, but it sure is a blessing. Mm -hmm. And that is a story about an African woman born in America who leaves the land of her birth and returns to the land of her ancestry mm -hmm. and what those challenges were. Um, people often ask me, um, did you ever feel that you've made a mistake in coming to Africa? Never. With all of the challenges, and I prefer to call them challenges instead of problems, uh, difficulties, they were challenges. It was different. Mm -hmm. But it was a blessing because I never ever thought that I would return to the land of my ancestry. I never thought I'd see Africa because in America I've been told that I didn't come from anywhere in Africa. Eh, few people in Africa running around with no clothes on, you know, speaking some strange language that nobody can understand, you know, and the lie that was told that, you know, when I told people I'm going to, I, why would you want to go to Africa? You know, God, we say, mash up your face. Why, you want to go? why would you want to go to Africa, to a place where they don't like you? They say Africans don't like African Americans. I said, well, they don't like me in America either. <laughs> so I don't give a damn. I'll go to Africa. But I found that not to be true. And so when I arrived in Africa, I found that a lot of the things that they told us about Africa was a lie. And I was angry. I was pissed off because had I known what I knew then, I would have been in Africa a long time ago. I wouldn't have stayed in, in, in America for 50 years. I'd have been gone, you see. So, so for me, I love Africa with all of its challenges. And based on the fact that we got 55 countries. So am I stuck on stupid? Do I go to a country that's in war? No. I'm looking for a peaceful place, like Rwanda. Rwanda's a peaceful place. I, I love Rwanda. That's right. Yes, yeah. But then you're from Ghana. I am. I've lived in Ghana <clears throat> for 32 years. I am now a Ghanaian citizen. I got my citizenship in 2016, which was granted to us by um, the Honorable uh, John Mahama who said at that time that he wasn't giving us anything. He was only restoring to us that which was rightfully ours, and that was the right to return mm -hmm. to the land of our ancestors. So I do have my citizenship. You know, people will say, well, why did it take you so long to get your citizenship? Well, first of all, I thought I was already a citizen. I'm an African living in Africa. Aren't I a citizen? Am I not a citizen? You're a citizen. <laughs> I'm a citizen. <laughs> but the Lord didn't see it like that. Mm -hmm. But all those years, I felt like I was a citizen. I did everything that citizens did except vote, which was okay with me. Mm -hmm. But I ran a business. I had a nonprofit organization. Mm -hmm. I lived in a village. Um, I went to market with everybody else. I had no problems. People didn't bother me. They helped me. Mm -hmm. You know. I, I don't, I didn't speak the language fluently, um, I speak in one word sentences, 
but I'm understood. <laughs> People know what the hell I'm talking about. You understand? Right. So, and so the, the things that I did being there, my, my primary objective in being in Africa is to encourage other Africans from the diaspora to take a chance and come home because Africa is, is our home. Bring, let's bring our talents, let us help with the redevelopment or the moving forward of Africa. That's, that's what I do. I introduce people to the spirit of their ancestors. The spirit of mm, Yes. Whoa. That's I, interesting. I, I live in a, a place called Elmina, mm. which is geographically situated between two major edifices, the Cape Coast Castle Dungeons and the Elmina Castle Dungeons, mm. on the Gulf of Guinea. And I live right between the two. Mm. So it's a really spiritual place, and whenever diasporan Africans come to Ghana, they all want to go to the castle dungeons. So I take them on tours to the castle dungeons because for those of us who are returning home, we're not tourists, and that's very, very important. We're not on a tour, okay? We're on a pilgrimage. So I take them into dungeons where we have an opportunity to get rid of some of that stuff that's on us. We have an opportunity to reconnect with the spirit of our ancestors. Because in those dungeons you can actually still feel, you can still smell the bodies of the hundreds and thousands of people who pass through those corridors. And so people have many different experiences. Some people scream and roll on the ground, other people cry, all sorts of emotions. But the thing is that we are reconnecting with our ancestors. So I help to facilitate that. And I only do it for Africans. I don't do it for white people at all. I don't allow white people to participate in those sacred ceremonies. And then when we leave the castle dungeons, I take them to One Africa, we go to the ocean, and I have them wash one another's feet. Because I, I'm not so puffed up that I can't reach down and wash the feet of my brother or the feet of my sister. And to give thanks to the ancestors for safely returning me home to my homeland. So, you know, those kind of things I do, and it's really important for us to be able to make that connection. Mm -hmm. Now, here in East Africa, you don't have that. Um, there are lots of things that go on in West Africa that you're not aware of. Mm -hmm. I mean, <clears throat> in West Africa, there were over 60 slave forts and dungeons along the west coast of Africa. 45 of those dungeons and forts were in Ghana. In Ghana. Mm -hmm. So as we come back and make that reconnection, whether it be in Sierra Leone, in Ghana, in Togo, in Nigeria, all of these countries, where they took our people. Mm -hmm. So now there's been a shift, there's a paradigm shift in that we are now returning to the land of my ancestors. Correct. And now I will tell anyone, mm -hmm. you don't have to just come back and go to Ghana. And I've learned that mm -hmm. in my traveling around Africa. Come to East Africa. East Africa is a beautiful place. That's right. We're different from the West. Mm -hmm. But we're still Africans. Are you running away from? What am I running away from? So you're escaping from America. Oh hell yeah! What am I? I'm running away from systemic racism. I'm running from um, running for my life because as a black person in America, because I'm black, I could wind up in prison. Mm -hmm. We have so many young men that are in prison today 
for crimes that they did not commit. And then you find out 20 or 30 years later after you spent your life in jail, oops, we made a mistake. You're, you're innocent, but you just took 30 years of my life. I have a friend who was in jail for 19 years for a crime he did not commit. And when they finally looked into it very a lot more carefully, they realized that information that could have freed him had been withheld. 19 years of his life he spent in prison. You spent 20 years of your life in prison because a white girl said that you raped her. And now she's getting conscience when she's getting ready to die. And oops, he didn't do it. So there are a lot of us in prisons in America for crimes that we did not commit. Um, and like I said, it's the systemic racism, the police, the, you know, no jobs, bad housing, homelessness, mm -hmm. all those kind of things. But does, does that mean Africa is sort of a perfect place? Because I still feel we have those other weaknesses as well. We have tribalism in Africa. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of corruption in Africa. Mm -hmm. That are uh, a lot of political instability in a number of states. Right. And why would someone live fine? America may not be so perfect. But America, I mean, Africa too ain't a state of saints. Well, no. I don't think that Africa is perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Mm -hmm. You have corruption in Africa. But you have corruption in America, okay? Um, you have white supremacy in America. You don't have white supremacy in, in Africa. Mm -hmm. You may have tribalism. Um, there are places that you can go and live a peaceful, rather peaceful existence. And the fact that as an African person born in America, the fact that I can return to the land of my ancestry after being told for years that I don't come from nowhere, you know, I don't have a culture. Yes, I have, an, I have a culture in America, but I don't have or did not have an African culture. I see the beauty of Africa, whether it's how we look, how we dress, the, the attitude that we have towards each other in Africa. And those are things that that, are, that are, are, are important. And I've lived, I've lived in America. I know America. I know America's good and it's bad. And my choice is to live someplace else in Africa. I never wanted to live in Europe. Never. Okay. I don't want to live with a bunch of white people. It don't mean that I, I hate them, but I'd rather live with you than live with um, Mzungu. You know. yeah. One of the great things to talk about is encouraging uh, Africans in the diaspora to come back to Africa, especially those who were born in the, in the US. Mm -hmm. um, I, f I feel like they might have challenges uh, about making that geographical change. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you say to them in terms of encouraging them to make that geographical change? One of the reasons that they have those um, reservations about Africa is because they don't know it. And because media has presented so much negativity about Africa. Generally when they show pictures of Africa, they go find the worst village, they find dirty little children. Children get dirty when they play in the dirt. I'd be dirty if I played in the dirt, okay? But they go to places where the, the building is falling down and the people are, looking, are hungry. They take those pictures and they send them back and say, this is Africa. They don't come into our homes. Look at this apartment, it's a beautiful apartment. I'm in the middle of, I'm in the middle of East Africa in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. Look at the size of the dag on TV. All, they don't show that. They come to my place. I live in a village. But the village that I live in, I've created a village for myself. Minus some amenities. But clean, cultural, mm -hmm. and so, for me, I would encourage those 
who are thinking about it, and for those that are not even thinking about it, I said, look, why don't you do this? Why don't you visit? Come and visit. Come and see for yourself what Africa is all about. Stop believing them, okay? Mm. They've been here in Africa for a long time. And we've treated them like kings and queens and we've been their servants and all the rest of that. And what did we get? Nothing. So I encourage our people to please come and see what Mother Africa has to offer. Come and see what we can do in Africa that I can't do in America. My place, I could never ever afford my place in America. Never. I'll never make that much money. I have a million dollar plus piece of property on the Gulf of Guinea in the land of my ancestors. And what I have been instructed to do is to bring the brothers and sisters home. So one of the things that I used to do is it, and I still do it, is called prepatriation counseling. It's counseling people on how to get ready to come to Africa. Ask them to come, because you know, some people say, oh yeah, I'm going to Africa. Jump up, I'm leaving, I'm going to Africa. Well, do you, do you have any money? Mm -hmm. uh, what are you going to do when you get to Africa? Mm -hmm. Okay, do you have some place to live? All right, well, what kind of, what kind of job or some? You can't come to Africa and get a job. Okay, when you tell me that your hourly rate is uh, 2,000 point something francs, not for the hour, for the day. Mm. I can't I can't work for that kind of money. What can I do with that? Y'all are magicians. <laughs> I swear you almost have a magic wand. You know, pass it over the money and make, <laughs> and make it take care of everything. Yeah. So the thing is that what do we bring to Africa? How are we going to manage when we get here? And so all of those are important questions. You just can't show up. You know, well, okay, I'm here. Now what? The African governments are not going to take care of you. Africa is not a welfare state. We don't get, um, you don't get welfare checks in Africa. You don't get kind of social service assistance in Africa. When social service comes to me, is to ask me to fix their car because they don't have any money. Well, we don't do that in America. In America, you go to social service expecting them to help to take care of you. <clears throat> so there are those kind of differences, cultural norms that we should familiarize ourselves with. And I tell all of my clients, don't just jump up and come to Africa unless you got it like that. Now, if, you, if your pockets are heavy and you can afford to just pack up your stuff and come to Africa, fine. But you need to have a plan. I had one of my clients, I counseled him, I counseled him. I looked up one day, he was in gun. I was like, what are you doing here? You were, oh yeah, Mama Anacus, yeah, Mama Africa. Yeah, I figured we were coming. So he came, his wife, four kids, and his mother. And they stayed for less than a year. When I looked up, he was on his way back to America. <laughs> he was on his way back to America. <laughs> I said, okay, son, I got to give it to you. You mm -hmm. tried. Huh? Well, not too long after that, maybe another year, I looked up, he was back. Mm -hmm. I said, you back again? He said, mama. When I left here the first time, I said, I am going to listen to what Mama Africa told me. I'm going to have a plan. I said, I'm glad to hear that, son. And he came back. He's now in Taiwan. <laughs> I love him. I do. I love them dearly. You know, some people will listen to what you have to say. Other people don't pay you no mind. But that's okay. We're all grown. Okay? So...
But, but you see, what happens currently is what we are taught in school, mm -hmm. what we experience from the books we read. Mm -hmm. is, you know, you hardly find as many books from Africans talking about Africa. Mm -hmm. They are there, but there are quite few. And the most common are the ones written by the Western mm -hmm. people. So we tend to think that it's really a perfect place. How are we going to change this mindset? where we can come together, those of us from that side and this side, where we can get together and exchange notes. The school system is not going to give you all that. In fact, the school system doesn't give you very much. When you come out of school, you have a Eurocentric education, not an Afrocentric education. So you know more about Shakespeare and um, uh, all these other people, but you don't know anything about yourself. If I ask the average person, who, do you know who Masa Musa is? Do you know who Hannibal is? Did you know that Solomon was a black man? Um, do you know that um, the Queen of Sheba, Louis Latimer, do you know that every time you turn on a light switch, you're supposed to think black? You don't know those things because you've never been taught those things. We were taught those things, not in school. The school system didn't teach us that as we were growing up. Mm -hmm. It took some of our historians, people like John Henry Clark, um, people like mm -hmm. Sheikh Anto Diop, um, different educators that came into our community and said, look, we're going to teach you. We want to show you who you are, that we're not just a bunch of niggas, okay? Or as now they, you can't... Whoop, the N-word. <laughs> the N-word, okay. So we're not a bunch of N-words. <laughs> so they came and they taught us. They, they, we had to give them three dollars now. If you go to university, you pay, back then, three hundred dollars per credit. So if the, if the course was three credits, it cost you nine hundred dollars. So for three dollars, they came into our community and they began to talk to us about our history, about who we were, the contributions that we as African people had made to the world at large. They began to inspire in us something other than the Tarzan and Jane movies, okay? There was no white man here swinging through the trees, mm. ah! mm. riding on an elephant. I didn't see that when I came here. <laughs> but when I was in America, <laughs> in America, that's what they told me. Mm. And I saw it in the movies. I saw it, okay? You know, talking gorillas and stuff like that, okay? So these men, and women that came into our community and began to light the fire under us about who it is that we were. In fact, we became more African than the Africans with our clothes, with our dress. I mean, we were playing drums in the park. I mean, we, we were becoming real Africans in America. Okay. And then you know, with Kwame Nkrumah, who invited us, 1957. And once we got to Africa and got a taste of what Africa was, it was like, shoot, I could eat this. I ate what America had that served me all these daggone years. I could eat this. And just the, 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 the thought that, you know, you walk through the street and you see people that look like you. I'm like, that looked like my daughter. That one looked like my son. And just black people everywhere. I was like, woo, it's raining. You know that song is raining, hallelujah. Raining, amen. Raining, black people. Okay. <laughs> right, so going forward, what do you think we as perhaps young people, because as you said, the, the, the people in the diaspora are the ones to change Africa. I believe as people here in Africa also have a low big role to play. Of course, you do. Of course, you you do. 
you should stay here. You shouldn't leave here and go to America and spend 40 years there and then come back and want to know why stuff ain't been done. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think that as we move forward as a collective, we can get a lot of things done for Africa. One of the reasons that I love Rwanda is that seeing what Rwanda went through with the genocide, having killed millions of people, that in 25 years that Rwanda has come to what it is, a showcase really for the rest of the world in terms of what you can do when you are working as a collective, when your leadership cares for its people. Now everybody may not, everybody doesn't agree. It's okay, but the majority do. And the place looks like you care. With 63% of your women in parliament, 63% of your parliament is female. Your government says that 35% of the workforce must be women. Because truly we were matriarchal before we became a patriarchal society. Okay. Your streets are so clean that you can eat off the streets. Different thing. Yes. I saw some guy sitting on the side of the gutter having his lunch. The place was spotless. It was clean. But I mean, those kind of things, the fact that it's easy or easier to do business. But if you and I work as a collective, we can get things done. And if you remember the illustration that I showed, um, I'm sorry we didn't put it on the board, um, the illustration of the, the circles that were all separated. The, we represent those circles, okay? Until and unless we connect the dots, and that's what we have to do. We have to connect the dots so that we are working as a collective to get things done. You know, you could say, well, that's easy for you to say. You lived in America. Well, if America was all that you think America is, I'd have stayed there. Okay? You would have stayed in America I would have, 50 years. I'd have, after 50 years, I'd have stayed there. No. I'd still be there. If Africa was all that you, if America is all that you think that America is. And right now, hey, with the, the pandemic that's going on. It's a pandemic. It's a pandemic. It's a plan. Trust me. And when you look at it, as I told you earlier this afternoon, there was an article in the paper and the, 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 the powers that be in the West are saying they don't understand why the coronavirus hasn't killed a lot more Africans. All the white people, all the people in America and Europe, thousands are dying. Well, what's wrong with us? So someone made the statement that, hmm, the reason that the, the pandemic you know, the, the virus is not getting us. It's because of poverty. That's why. What a fool ass answer. <laughs> but anyway, whatever the reason is, our numbers are nowhere near what the West is. And that is the more advanced society. America is the number one country was in the world, okay? And statements were made when this virus started that the streets are going to be paved with dead Africans. Duh. Whose street is paved with dead people? It's not Africa. So. That's so intriguing, Ben. Yeah. So, for me, I love Africa. I love you. <clears throat> I love you all, my sons and, and daughters. My Speaking of the great books you've written, why do you think we should read them? What are those major two or three points that we should pick from them as a concrete? I think that in reading my books, 
It will give you a better understanding about Africa, America. It's also a book that offers encouragement to diasporan Africans who are thinking about coming home to Africa. Um, it also offers a plan on what do we do? What are the things that we can do coming to Africa? The contributions that we have made. So I, I really have to take a moment and, you know, give uh, credit where credit is also due to my king man, Nana Kofu, because he and I made this journey together. He was that kind of man that did not think, the rest of the world, all my family thought, oh gosh, she lost her mind, she's gone crazy, she's coming to Africa. But my husband did not think that I was crazy. And my husband came with me and we built One Africa. We established that legacy for our family. In terms of my other book, Ababio, which is a book about, Ababio means he or she who was away, and I was away, and I have returned. And it is an anthology. It is a short stories written by other people who have also repatriated, talking about what their challenges had been. Most of the people who wrote chapters Many of them are still alive, some of them have died, but it also says that it is very important for us to write our history as opposed to waiting for somebody to come along and write what they think we went through, okay, in our own words. So basically, um, basically that's about it. Um, the things that I do, I think, I feel like are inspired by my ancestors. <clears throat> I just want us to be a part of not only our own growth and development, but part of the growth and development of Africa. Great. And it's a two-way street. Mm -hmm. I learn from you and you learn from me. I'm not an act, we are not, some of, some of us are, really, a pain in the ass. <laughs> you know, some, of, some of us really give you a hard time. But overall is that we share the knowledge so that we grow together. together. Okay. Great. So that we make Africa great. Thank you so much for okay. this incredible opportunity hearing from you. And we come to the end of the talk. Okay. I would like to encourage every single individual out there to look for this book. Returning. It's called Returning Home Ain't Amen. Easy. But it sure is a blessing. And if you ever get to Ghana, if I'm not in Rwanda, because I'm trying to live in Rwanda, but if you ever get to Ghana, you look for One Africa. That's the name of our place. One Africa. One Africa Health Resort Restaurant and Tours. You ask anybody for One Africa, and they can t they think that's my name, by the way. Mama Africa. Mama Africa. Returning home ain't easy, but it sure is a blessing. Why did you write that book? Because I escaped. escaped. I escaped. From yes. America. I escaped from America. You escaped from America at age of 50. Yes. And I wrote that book so that people would know one, why I escaped and how to escape. <laughs> it's been a great moment. It's been a great moment chatting in Mama Africa. And we learned something incredible. Just to say, we should write our own stories. We should yes. wait for the rest of the world to write about us. It's a challenge to every single young person out there. After all, the future belongs to us. Thank you so much for following.